like i don't know like it actually came up i was like messing around with some filters on like powerpoint it's like oh purple then i thought of prince and i thought a party like it's 1999 and then a couple of days ago i was like oh yeah amish paradise weird al he actually drops party like it's 1699 in the lyrics like so you know this is like a little bit in homage to prince a little bit in homage to weird al <laughs> you know like good times good times <laughs> So I'm partying right now, Brett. <laughs> oh, excellent. That's yeah. that's what we want. That is yeah. what we want. Mm -hmm. This is to be a festive occasion. And well, I am wearing my raspberry beret in homage to Prince. <laughs> you just can't see it. I'm assuming Tom will show up with his little red Corvette, but you know, like that's... And purple rain might start falling any second. Hey, oh, Kate! Nice. Good to see you, Sarah. Oh, it's so lovely to oh, see hi. you. Oh, I miss you guys. I miss you. Uh, my son is on his way to BC right now for tree planting. He should be arriving any moment. He's Do you know where he's planting? Yep, way up at uh, Fort St. James. You know, <laughs> and a bit north of Prince George. Well, not too far. Lisa is like, what, 40 minutes from Fort St. James? Oh, wow. Oh, cool. Or 15 if you're driving, Sarah. That, <laughs> no, it's not that I speed. It's just that I endorse defensive quickness. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. Um, as you can see, this is a lovely group of people that you've stumbled upon if this is your first time coming to Cross Pollinations. Um, so just a quick introduction for where you are and why. Um, this is a lovely collaboration between the Canadian Association for Health Humanities and the League of Canadian Poets, um, bringing together sort of the medical health humanities and arts lens into a beautiful sort of monthly uh, review, educational opportunity and chance to sort of see you know, healthcare from different perspectives. Um, we're coming to you, Katie and I are coming to you from Toronto, which is the home of, you know, the Haudenosaunee, Ashinaabek, and Mississaugas, and governed by Treaty 13. Um, I don't like to sort of do performative uh, land acknowledgements, so I will say yeah. sort of from our side of things, the League Office has been taking a few classes through Coursera to learn more about the Indigenous peoples from across Canada. Um, I encourage everybody to take part in that. It's free. We've been having a great time with it and learning a lot, and it's really informed the way we've been approaching things. Um, tonight, we're very lucky. We have uh, Brett Shrew, who is a physician, a health humanitarian. Um, I was saying to anybody who was here earlier, uh, quite the writer of charming emails, um, and stepped up to present this tonight, even though it's a very busy month for health providers. Um, and so I'll say we're going to, if anybody's been to this event before, we're going to do it in slightly a different order because Brett is off to provide necessary child care for young children. So we're going to have Brett present, we're going to ask for some questions, and then we'll have Katie coming up after. Um, so Katie is a poet, uh, a yoga teacher, a good friend of mine, um, a constant friend of the League of Canadian Poets, someone I experiment with on projects all the time. And has some great uh, poetry about her own experiences with healing, healthcare, and sort of recovery. And so you'll be hearing from both of these lovely people tonight. Um, as you can see on your screen, we've got a lovely and hilarious title, which has uh, prompted a few emails of joy from people to me. <laughs> um, so Brett, if you're ready and coffeeed up, uh, you can take it away and we'll all enjoy what you have to say. I'm never fully coffeeed up. Like, I think the number of coffees per day is always like N plus one, but you know, like maybe close. <laughs> so such it is. Um, Leslie, thanks for that. That's awesome. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right on. Cool. Um, yeah. So uh, in the child care I have to provide it, it's not, it's not like clinical care. Yeah. It's literally hanging out with my daughter mm -hmm. before when our child care expired. I you got a picture, I'm, man. Like playing with a lot of stuff. Yeah, so it's like, super fun. Yeah, so um, tonight, somebody talk to you. this afternoon, but this is your computer, isn't it? Yes. So we don't have a camera. Oh. Other presenters going too? It's all good. Um, we're, uh, wherever you are, um, we are going to do some talking now about um, 
partying like it's 1699, political economy of medical education in an era of societal needs. I'm a consultant pediatrician in Victoria. I'm also a uh, PhD candidate in educational studies at UBC. And uh, I'm the outgoing secretary communications person for the Canadian Association for Health, Health Humanities, which was like a super fun ride. Um, and um, this is kind of related a little bit to my doctoral dissertation. So um, feel free to interrupt throughout. Like this is not meant to be like the world's most formal thing. Um, disclosure wise, I should mention I am affiliated with the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation in Montreal as a 2017 scholar. They've been super supportive um, throughout the doctoral journey or probably marathon as it actually is because I don't know where the end finish line is of this thing um but they've been great so gratitude to them and I don't know where today finds you but it finds me as it usually does these days where I work live and play which is the traditional territories of the Wasanich people of southern Vancouver Island I live specifically on territory governed by one of the 14 Vancouver Islander Douglas treaties and, and the portion of land that I live on is in treaty from the Sound South Treaty of 7 February 1852. Um, just to riff off of what Leslie had to say, those treaties were actually negotiated by uh, the Hudson's Bay Company prior to BC joining Confederation and then they were signed over to the Crown. and. They're fraught, we'll put it that way. Um, this is one of the few parts of BC that is uh, doesn't fall under unceded land, so to speak, at least by the traditional idea of treaty. Um, so needless to say, that's a longer conversation and a very necessary one in and of itself. Um, we're in the middle of the third wave of COVID. I'm coming to you live from my house. You're coming to me live from your house. Everybody is kind of in their house. So I thought we'd take a house tour um, and go visit somebody else's house. And so for those that don't know, this is the house of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. It's a lovely house. It's in Ottawa. It's a former convent, I believe. And I've never been there. I'm a Royal College fellow and I'd love to go there because the architecture is like apparently pretty astounding. I think this is like the grand council room where they meet every, you know, couple of, of months to discuss things. There's stained glass. I think that's part of the library. Super cool. And I, I could talk about physical architecture like all day. I'm not an architect, so you probably wouldn't want to hear that. Um, but on the topic of houses, I do get interested in how houses are managed. Um, and I get interested in how houses are managed because if you sort of track house management back to ancient Greek, you get the, fr oops, oh dear, what happened there? We'll try that again. Hmm, I lost my slides. Oh no, my thing just shut down. Well, shoot, let's try this again. Sorry guys, my uh, PowerPoint crashed. Hmm. Good times. Uh, let me see if I can find it again. Oh boy, now we're gonna have like a lot of stuff opening up. Hold on. Oh, we'll try. You can always email it to me, Brett, and I'll uh, or to Leslie, and I'll try to forward it from our machines if that would help at all. Yeah, should be good. It'll take just a second. Sorry about that. Can you guys still see my screen, or did that pop off too? That went away. But don't oh, worry, okay. it's a patient-friendly crew. I'm sure we can give you a sec, don't worry. <laughs> right on, sorry about that. No idea what happened there. Uh, let's try this again. We'll just fast forward through. Thankfully, we were like two slides in, so there we go. So yeah, um, so I get interested in house management as, as I was talking about, and I, I also love words. So I, I find it really interesting when we tack back into ancient Greek, of course, house management becomes oikos nimian. So, um, politicos is, of course, an add on there that doesn't show up in house management. But when we take ecos and nemian, they become the word economy in contemporary English. And so here we're talking about house management or political economy. So, how might an influential socio political institution in medical education, such as the Royal College, manage its house and its associated domains? And what I'm interested in, too, at least in this part of my dissertation, is how these techniques of government might impact upon educating um, physicians and training to work for the social right to health care as laid out by the Canada Health Act. So what is the Royal College for, for those that aren't medical on today's talk? Um, more or less, it was founded in 1929 from, quote, simple beginnings. That's pulled shamelessly right from their website. And it was given the legitimacy to do so, if I remember correctly, by the government of Canada to specifically monitor postgraduate medical training. Since those humble beginnings, nearly 100 years later, it now has assets of $50 million. 
Its revenues include or $66 million a year on their last financial statement. More than half of that comes from membership dues. Uh, I'm a member, I pay my dues and they can't yell at me for it. Um, another 16 million of that comes from exam fees. And I should point out that if you want to be licensed in this country, um, you kind of, as a specialist physician at least, you kind of need to quote past your Royal College. So they kind of got you over the barrel there. It's not the only way to get licensed, it's by far the easiest. What does the Royal College do? Well, it's this is also shamelessly ripped from their website. It's not a licensing or disciplinary body. Its mission is educational and dedicated to setting standards. In Canada, this includes things such as postgraduate training program accreditation. Now, this is done in partnership with the College of Family Physicians of Canada and the Collège de Médecine de Québec. And part of this, and a big part of, of what goes into accreditation, is a sort of current shift to competence by design, which is based on the CANMEDS framework that we're going to spend a lot of time chatting about today. Um, for those that don't know, medical education in Canada is steadily and marchingly <laughs> headed towards a full competency-based medical education system. Um, programs are flipping over. Pediatrics has actually started finally to go in, in July of uh, this year. It was supposed to be a couple of years ago, but it's taken some time. Um, so competency-based medical education as sort of structured around the Ken Mids framework is, is becoming a thing. The Royal College also has some work it does internationally, and that was founded in 2009, and, and more or less over the last 11 years, the Royal College has partnered with a myriad of, of international um, jurisdictions to sort of export CanMeds and the high standards as quoted by them of Canadian medical education. So um, I don't have the money on that one, but um, I'd be interested. <laughs> Look at that. Um, so I've mentioned CANMEDS a few times. Now, CANMEDS is actually trademarked, so it's no longer an acronym, but it used to stand for the Canadian Medical Education Directives for Specialists. Um, so the dots between the M, the E, the D, and the S that would have showed up in 1996 are no longer gone because they don't officially exist anymore. So for those that don't know uh, CANMEDS, and again, shamelessly ripped from the CANMEDS 2015 framework is this sentence. I do a lot of ripping lines out of other texts for analysis, so I just kind of do this a lot, um, but I always I always kind of like give the reference. Um, CANMEDS is an educational framework that was first created by the Royal College in the 1990s. It describes the abilities physicians require to effectively meet, uh, oops, the healthcare needs of the patients, or sorry, the people that they serve. Um, again, for those that don't know, um, competence is the way it's increasingly constructed and from a medical perspective in Canada is based in a discourse of competence as performance. And so um, each of these roles, all seven, so medical expert, communicator, collaborator, leader, health advocate, scholar, and professional are uh, assemblages of competencies more or less um, that medical students, well, I should say medical learners, because um, we'll talk about why it's students and residents now, that medical learners need to sort of demonstrate that they've mastered um, and that those who are fully qualified need to kind of embody um, to demonstrate that they're capable of independent practice. Um, I mentioned CANMEDS not just because I'm picking on the Royal College, I don't intend to do that, but I think it's important to note that the Royal College's purview is specifically postgraduate medical education, but in 2017, it launched the CANMEDS Consortium. And in that move, um, with 12 other leading partner organizations in medical education uh, and patient care across the country, each of these 12 bodies uh, agreed to use the CANMEDS framework as sort of their, their governing ethos. So the intention uh, was to sort of harmonize and align um, the training and practice system with that of a competency-based framework uh, based on CANMEDS. And so to kind of click around the clock here, these include at the top, the College of Family Physicians of Canada, the Canadian Federation of Medical Students, uh, the Fédération des Médecins Nationaux de Québec, uh, the Medical Council of Canada, the Fédération Médicale Étudiante de Québec, uh, the Canadian Medical Protective Association, the Association of Faculties of Medicine of Canada, the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, uh, the Federation of Medical Regula Regulatory Authorities of Canada, blah, never get that one out uh, quite right, the Canadian Medical Association, Resident Doctors of Canada, and the Collège des Médecins du Québec. So more or less, things have moved from CANMED sort of being situated solely in post-grad um, to kind of throughout the training and practice spectrum. And that's been about four years in the making. And so CANMEDS has sort of migrated out of Royal, the Royal College and sort of enracinated in these other bodies as well. That's the consortium, there you go. So I am specifically interested, at least in this part of my dissertation, in, in kind of figuring out what the relationship is between the profession, 
and society from an educational perspective. And so I really want to lean in today to this idea that comes from the CanMeds methodology, or this line, I should say, that many people in Canada and around the world feel that the strength of the CanMeds framework lies in the fact that it was derived explicitly from societal needs. No language that speaks specifically to this, at least in this specific educational framework, largely cr clusters in the professional role. So turning to that in a little bit more detail, I'm going to kind of tell you what I did for this part of my dissertation, which is basically just a chapter. <laughs> and unfortunately, they don't just let you finish with one chapter, which stinks, but it is what it is. Um, so what I undertook was a critical discourse analysis based upon uh, the work of Michel Foucault. And I drew a particular application of CDA from Norman Fairclough's work. And I like Fairclough's work um, to kind of bring Foucault's rubber to the road, so to speak, um, in part because he's very good with sort of granular um, textual analysis and how you might link those to social and political effects. I also like him too, because he draws on Michael Halliday's work and that was sort of my orientation into the field in the first place. So there you go. Um, what was this? It was a policy analysis of text related to medical professionalism and associated documents specifically looking to see how the relationship between the medical profession and society is constructed in these texts. Again, taking the angle of an educational perspective and looking to see what the social and political effects of this construction might be. So the archive that we built was all three versions of the CanMeds framework. So CanMeds most recent version came out in 2015. There was an earlier version in 2005. And the first version came out in 1996, although it's actually titled CanMeds 2000 Skills for the New Millennium. I also drew on series drafts of the 2015 revision one through four. And as a genealogist slash discourse analyst, I really love it when people put like their interim drafts up for public consumption because it makes it really fun to track the language. Of note, draft four is the exact same thing as the final framework, um, but it was nice to be able to track the language sort of backwards uh, from 2015 to 2005 because I had a, a couple of stops on the road, so to speak. We also were able to draw on some consultation reports from the 2015 revision that were in the public domain and contextualize this with some supporting literature from the 1990s Educating the Future Physicians for Ontario or FPO project and surrounding events such as the 1986 Ontario Physicians Strike that kind of spearheaded FPO. I used FPO because FPO is by and far the source material from which the initial CanMeds framework draws. And finally, uh, this is further contextualized with some literature and theory on the professions as a social phenomenon. So, why am I doing this? Well, this is part of a larger genealogical project, again, from a Foucauldian sense. So I, I basically look at dusty books and I'm a historian of the present, more or less in tr through training increasingly, still pediatrician, I guess, but there you go, um, looking to see what sort of grounds might be there to elaborate an identity of physician as medical citizen. Um, and this is in the interest of reframing and, and sort of refooting medical education uh, to help ensure that the social right to health care spouse in the Canada Health Act of 1984 is actually fully enacted. We'll talk a little bit about why social rights differ from civil and political rights onward uh, further on in the talk, but that's sort of what the rationale of this this talk or this sort of this research is, and it's it's raison d'être, we'll say. So results. And so what I was interested in as, as a discourse and analyst here um, was looking to see what sort of discourses were operant in this part of the CanMeds text. And so um, for those that don't know, the anatomy of a Royal College CanMeds role, such as the professional role, includes a short definition, uh, a little more pithy, but a little thicker description. These are followed by key concepts, and those are then followed by key competencies. And under each of those key competencies, there are several enabling competencies. Without drilling into it in great detail, these in turn have been linked to milestones and entrustable professional activities in this new competence by design framework. I'm gonna bracket that because that gets a little, it's, it's not beyond my pay grade, I suppose, but it's sort of a bit of a distraction for what I wanna talk about today. So we can talk about that more if you want. Um, so in, in analyzing these texts, what did we come up with? Well, we came with kind of two key discourses. We um, you know, were very creative in the labeling of this one. The title of the talk was really creative. These are not very creative at all. So the first we came up with, not surprisingly, is being professional. Now, being professional addresses desired physician qualities, behaviors, and practices that are deemed applicable and appropriate to what we might call individual level patient care clinical encounters. These tend to be described in an elaborate and comprehensive fashion. <laughs> hey, Sue. Um, 
<laughs> Clear, detailed, and logical connections are on display in the key concepts, key competencies, and enabling competencies here that are subtended to two areas of commitment to patients and commitment to self. This role is sort of broken into four commitments. Commitment to patients and commitment to self are kind of two of them. The other two sort of lodge under being a professional, and those are commitment to the profession and commitment to society, although they also talk about accountability. So the other discourse, playing with nouns and adjectives, is the nominal form, or being a professional. And this addresses aspects of physician duties and responsibilities that relate to the profession itself, as well as to societal level healthcare concerns. So this sort of moves things beyond the individual pale. Overall, it is discursively constructed in a less clear fashion. It is not to say it is totally opaque and vague and, and out there, but the overall um, way in which the discourse hangs together is a little less good. <laughs> and the reason it's a little less good is because on the one hand, um, the accountability to the profession part is actually pretty nice. Um, it largely follows the pattern of strong links and descriptions between those key concepts key competencies and enabling competencies that we see in being professional. And this is sort of most on evidence in the commitment to the profession section of that role. The accountability to society piece, and again, this is where I get interested, is like vague, circular, and far less developed um, to the point that the connections sort of just define themselves, so to speak. It's sort of like, you know, if somebody were to write a definition is the definition of a word, and that's sort of like, yeah, that sounds good enough. The language looks nice, but it doesn't really say much. Um, so when I turn to the description section of this to try to drill into what they might be getting at more in the accountability from society thing, there's sort of three areas I want to point to. Um, one is that physicians are said to serve an essential role. Two is that the professional role is said to reflect contemporary society's expectations of physicians, which include clinical competence, a commitment to ongoing professional development, promotion of the public good, adherence to ethical standards, and values such as integrity, honesty, altruism, humility, respect for diversity, and transparency with respect to potential conflicts of interest. Finally, they also argue that professionalism is the basis of the implicit contract between society and the medical profession, which grants the privilege of physician-led regulation with the understanding that physicians need to be accountable to those served, ergo patients, to society, to their professions, and to themselves. The professional role is also interesting to me for the reason that this asterisk shows up. It's the one time in a 45 or so page document that an asterisk shows up, and it's the one time that anything's explicitly referenced. And so um, the explicit references here link back to work by Richard and Sylvia Cruz. Um, the former is an orthopedic surgeon by training and the former dean of the McGill Faculty of Medicine. The latter is an endocrinologist by training and the former head of medicine at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal, um, both of whom then went on to have like really impressive careers in medical professionalism, just like after they had like first retired <laughs> and moved on to do some work in professional identity as well. So they're, they're highly accomplished to say the least. Um, and I, I wish that I will have this level of productivity when I'm 90, we'll put it that way. Um, but the papers that they draw on from the cruces are actually labeled in this text. And it's to those that I want to turn because with discourse analysis and certainly with genealogy, it's fun you just kind of keep pulling on the threads to see where they go. So when I turn to what's referenced, one of the key of the two papers, and they sort of say the same thing, but one of the papers is relatively short and it talks a lot about the implicit contract of, of medicine with society basically and there's a number of claims made in this text that make me a little bit suspect i suppose it's probably safe to say one of the first claims is that medicine's contract with society has always been more implicit than explicit not sure what to say about that because again it's not further referenced um secondly they claim that this contract functioned reasonably well when both medicine and society are relatively homogeneous sharing many values I struggle a lot when people refer to some version of an idealized past again without referencing. Um, this is sort of a tapa concept, and I don't really know to which kind of past they're referring to. I suspect this probably relates somewhat to the time in which professional medicine had a lot more pull on health policy in Canada. Um, because we had people from professional medicine in cabinet, for example, had a prime minister at one point, Charles Tupper. Um, this possibly is harkening back to a time where there was a lot more professional medicine direct voice in government policy at the cabinet level or even as MPs, I'm not sure. Further though, they say that medicine knew what society expected of individual physicians and of the profession as a whole, which again seems like a bit of a broad claim. For its part, they also claim society understood what uh, it wanted from those responsible for care of the sick. 
And then they go on to say that in the 1960s and the 1970s, which sort of coincides with the uh, loss of professional medicine's ability to sort of pull the levers of government a bit more, <laughs> all forms of authority were challenged. They quote that social science scientists argue that a big group of people, social scientists, argued that medicine abused its monopoly to further its own interests, had self-regulated poorly, and its organizations were more interested in serving their members than society. So this is sort of the break point they refer to, and then they kind of skip forward back to this idea that, again, medicine's contract is still implicit. So they say, although much of it is unwritten, it is possible to outline broadly the terms of the contract by examining both the expectation of the medical profession and those of society. I don't have references on where these expectations are coming from of note, but these are what's listed. And again, for people that may be considered to be experts in the field, perhaps we can take them initially at face value, I suppose. So medicine's expectations are said to be the following. Autonomy, which makes sense for a profession that prides itself on self-regulation. Um, in Canada, I should mention, we are one of the last jurisdictions that allows this degree of self-regulation autonomy. Um, just saying. Monopoly on uh, practices of healing, status and rewards, because people that train in medicine put a lot of time in and therefore they should be compensated for it, I guess. Um, trust and a functioning healthcare system. Those are said to be medicine's expectations. Society's expectations, on the other hand, are said to be the following. Services of the healer, guaranteed competence, altruistic service, morality and integrity, the promotion of the public good, transparency and accountability, all of which you know, don't sound horrible by any means. Um, but I'm a little bit troubled because I'm not sure where they're coming from. Um, and again, I, I like it when things are referenced. I love it when things are referenced, actually. Um, but I get a little chuffed when I don't have more threads to pull on. And so um, what we'll kind of turn to now, though, is kind of the question that sort of beats at the heart of this talk is from which society are these expectations actually derived? And, and whose societal expectations does the professional role reflect? Um, you know, um, my definition of society might, as a straw version, might be something like, you know, the composition of constitutive publics um, that make up a, a federal state, for example. Um, and that's a really rough definition. Um, physicians in the profession of medicine are a part of that society, but they also tend to really demand and claim to remain a part, uh, or apart, I should say, from that society. So anyway, we'll, uh, we'll drill into this a little bit more here. So what I got curious about is to what degree was the public consulted in the formation of such a, well, influential framework such as CAMEDS and the roles that derive from it. So when we go to the consultation process for CAMEDS, um, the document that sort of encapsulates all of this in a nice format is called What We Heard, Sharing the Results of the CAMEDS 2015 Series 1 and Series 2 Consultations. Again, publicly available, super fun. Amongst other consultation processes, eight web-based focus groups in 90 minutes duration were held in like spring 2014 between the series one and series two releases. One of these focus groups of eight people is from the public. Sounds okay. I should point out this is out of the nearly 1,100 people who were involved in the overall consultation process that included the focus groups, national online surveys, and written submissions. If you want to do the math on this, and I have, this also corresponds to 0.00002% of the 2016 Canadian population. Further, it's highly unlikely to represent a sample that is inclusive of the diverse communities and populations that comprise the country. Fair enough, and I can understand, like, people are busy, maybe there wasn't a ton of time. Uh, you know, but statements like the following then are technically true, but kind of disingenuous when we look at it from that lens. So when in what we heard on page seven, we get a paragraph such as many participants have told us that a key strength of the CAMEDS framework is the fact that its original design in the 1990s was informed in part by public input. Knowing this, we wanted to be sure that the 2015 update includes, again, the perspectives of the people who depend on Canadian physicians for their health care. So yeah, I guess, um, but eight? I'm bolding this statement because this statement shows up a few times in different ways, depending on the audience to which it is targeted. Um, and so when we look at different versions of the 2015 framework, what we find in the final version, which is the Canada's 2015 framework, draft four, et cetera, intended largely for public cons consumption, like the What We Heard document, many people in Canada and around the world feel that the strength of the CanMeds framework lies in the fact that it was derived exclusively from societal needs. The same passage, if we go to the Series 2 and Series 3 drafts, is instead, many people in Canada and around the world feel that the strength of the CAMEDS framework lies in the fact that it was made by physicians for physicians. 
it's literally in the same part of the text. It's the same page, it's the same paragraph, it's the same location, it's a different, well, it's a different predicate, basically. So society, despite its needs being invoked as the principal driving force of the framework, paradoxically seems to have very little, if anything, to stay in its latest creation. Now, if we go back to the beginning of Canmeds, which was not that long ago, um, the Canmeds 2000 project was sort of launched in the mid-90s. The group that called themselves the Societal Needs Working Group of Note was comprised primarily of physicians. Public focus group data was used in this process. I want to be clear about that. Um, but it was entirely lifted from the Educating the Future Physicians for Ontario project. There is no other evidence that I can find, and I, I want to I want to hammer that home that I can find. There may be other evidence out there. I just haven't been able to find it um, that involves the public in the determining of societal needs. Any public consultations sent through FPO appear to have been limited to southern, eastern, and western Ontario. If this were not the time of pandemic, I would have found myself in one of the University of Toronto's libraries that has the 20 FPO documents, specifically all the policy papers that were written on it, simply to see to which degree um, the public was actually consulted, how many, where exactly. I do know that one of, like when we look at the paper written off of that from 1993, this was at a time where it was like, <laughs> I, I don't even know, like um, seven, they, they spoke about seven special populations, two of whom are described as quote native and the other was described as quote women. So like, I don't know, that seems a little sketch. Again, these were done in the early 1990s. I, I, I would point out that that was like literally the last time the Jays won the series and like the last time the Habs won the Stanley Cup. Nunavut wasn't even a territory yet and the internet was like barely a thing, like barely a thing, like barely a thing. Email was like really exciting. So it's reasonable to suggest then, I think that the societal expectation side of the implicit contract might be at best 30 years out of date or, Perhaps more concerning, this scenario really might raise some questions as to whether, to which degree, by which mechanisms, and why the candidates framework, the Royal College, and the other members of the consortium have authorized themselves to speak for and about the society that they are ostensibly to serve. I don't have a job as a pediatrician without patients. I don't exist. So my position as a pediatrician is fundamentally, inexorably relational. So if I am to serve society, I need a much better reason and a lot better justification than somebody sort of putting words in society's mouth for me doesn't make me happy. So it's reasonable to suggest that the professional role does not reflect contemporary society's expectations, but probably constitutes them in a certain way. One key concern with returning time and time again to justify one's actions by appeals to implicit contract as well, it's, it's just that, it's implicit. Like, I mean, we have an implicit contract, I guess right now I can say whatever it means, right? Like its meaning can be preferentially shaped by whoever the more powerful group is and who, what they say it means. This can be used as a technique, of course, of shaping power relations. Oops, and go back there. And, and I would say that I'm aware that they're drawing the term implicit contract from a couple of papers from the United Kingdom in the early 2000s. But what troubles me again is recurrent appeals to the social contract in, in a number of different texts. I'm reading Surveillance Capitalism right now by Shoshana Zuboff, which is a very nice book. But again, uncritical application of some term social contract. And so I'm not really sure that we actually know what it means and what we're doing with it when we talk about it, other than kind of maybe to paper over some difficult conversations. I don't know. I think it matters, though, because Canada is a country now of more than 37 million people whose health care needs are going to vary, not just individually, but with the social, cultural, economic, and political context they find themselves in. Um, you know, authoring society runs the real danger of not only misrepresenting what societal needs are, but it also potentially undermines trust and accountability to that society. It shapes educational practices in ways that reproduce this power relationship, and it may negatively impact upon the equitable distribution of healthcare. You know, so what might be going on here? I, I want to quickly pause and say, like, the Canada Health Act, as we know, is based on five pillars, two of which are universality and accessibility, right? And so what the healthcare needs of somebody living in Thompson or living in Wack Brochet or Shimadawa or Hay River, for example, are maybe very different than what they look like in downtown Toronto or in Westmount or in Shaughnessy or Osborne Heights, you name it. And this isn't to put a dichotomy between rich and defavorized whatsoever. It's to recognize the fact that healthcare contexts are 
quite different even within 200 meters. I think if we put anybody in Gastown, had them walk to Hastings and Maine, and then into Vancouver's Chinatown, that would sort of hit you between the eyes about how different healthcare contexts can vary, even within a very small geog physical geography, right? So um, it's probably not a bad idea to think about including more voices of society, which are going to talk about societal needs. And so what might be going on here? Well, Again, returning to the original question, how might an influential socio-political institution in medical education manage its house and associated domains? What benefits come or accrue to it from speaking for the society it purports to serve? And I'm going to return a little bit again to Foucault's work on governmentality to kind of unpack this a little bit. Um, what are the roots of contract theory? Well, as we know, it's kind of a 17th century attempt to reconcile practices of government with the maintenance of sovereignty, right? Um, probably the best example that comes to people's mind is the work of Jean-Jacques Rousseau in Genève in the early kind of 18th century, but that builds on some work in the later kind of 17th century and sort of out of theories of government that come from the, the kind of mid to early 16th century. Foucault will say in his governmentality text, contract theory enables the founding, uh, oops, there we go, <laughs> the founding contract, the mutual pledge of rule and subjects um, to function as sort of a theoretical matrix for deriving the general principles of an art of government. Now, these are concerns certainly of working for the common good. The sovereign must always, if he is to be a good sovereign, have as his aim the common welfare and the salvation of all. And I'm not implying that the Royal College by any way, shape, or form or the Commons Consortium partners are nefarious in their dealings. I'm a member of the Royal College. They do a lot of good work. I'm more interested in unintended effects, not sort of just like trying to tear down cathedrals for the sake of tearing down cathedrals. These are also concerns though about how to survey and control populations and knowledge. And so ultimately the end or goal of, end or, or goal of sovereignty is the exercise of sovereignty. And, you know, there's a direct line of heritage that goes between Rousseau and kind of thinkers on contract theory with Adam Machiavelli, who was one of the first persons to write on the art of government in the European West. Point is, the primary aim of the prince from Machiavelli's perspective is to retain his principality. That's it. That's all. Keep power. So grounding this framework, if we move back to our example and societal needs, gestures towards the common good, I don't disagree. The language is nice. But the Royal College's authoring of society and its elaborations of policies and frameworks is a key technique, I would argue, by which self-regulation, autonomy, and privilege can be implicitly maintained. Offhandedly, I was having my uh, practice review, as we tend to do like every five or 10 years or so in BC, and my examiner made an offhanded comment that I thought was really important. You know, he's like, it's really good that physicians are doing this for physicians. You wouldn't want a non-physician reviewing how you practice, would you? And it's not, a, it's, not, it's not a question that demands an answer. It's a rhetorical question like, could you pass the salt, please? Of course I can pass the salt. It's not that sort of question, right? So these discursive practices may unintentionally, doing so though, I would say these discursive practices may unintentionally constrict professional medicine's understanding of the myriad healthcare needs of the diverse Canadian society and its constitutive publics. They might potentially undermine trust and accountability to that society again, in, in shape educational practices in ways that reproduce this asymmetric power relationship. And so we might honestly ask whose house and domains are being better cared for, those of societies in its interests or those of the Royal College in its interests. So take home messages I wanna leave you with cause we're like kind of out of time um, and back to the purple. So, you know, if you wanna start playing purple rain slowly like crescendo in the background, that'd be cool. Uh, the sovereignty of the professional medicine claims and the speaking for society it practices appear to be more in line with political models of governance from the 17th and 18th centuries. This is highly concerning at a time when the governing framework of competency-based medical education and its current avatar of, of can meds as well as competence by design are powerfully ascendant. They're not powerfully ascendant. They've sort of cleared the field. The, the war is over, so to speak. Um, and this is also a time where the healthcare needs of Canadian society are arguably perhaps have never been more diverse. Um, if we're to educate physicians to work for the equitable realization of the social right to health care, and I think this is key simply because, as we know, social rights are not charter rights, but full realization of things like social rights to health care are absolutely necessary if full expression of the civil and political rights that are enumerated in the charter are going to be fully enacted by people that are charter protected. So to do so, we need to consider alternative models upon which, uh, whose political economy rather and practices are based upon a relationship with society, arguably, that is democratically produced, regularly made rather than kind of a one-time given slipshod implicit contract sort of thing. 
In recognizant that society and its constitutive publics not only are able, but probably should speak on behalf of their own needs a lot more than they've been allowed to. I'm done. Um, so thanks so much. Here's a really, really small font list of references if you want to look up anything. And um, I will stop talking because that was a really long run on sentence. So thank you for being here. I know everybody's got like a bajillion things going on. So thanks for, thanks for listening to me and my weird hair. Yeah. Brett, that was so great. Thank you so much. I'll say like my understanding of medical information is limited, but I found this totally fascinating. And I'm sure those who have a wider context found it even more interesting. Um, I know you have to go. So we're going to just take maybe one question if you're up for answering maybe one question and then we'll, we'll get you out of here. Um, if anyone has a question. I can stick around until about 10 till, so that's, that's okay. Okay, perfect. Um, if anyone has a question and wants to sort of, uh, okay, I see Sarah. Do you want to pop out? <laughs> yeah, um, I just want to ask, and I'm hoping that Kate might be able to answer this as well through poetic uh, intervention, but Brett, is there a role for poetry in making uh, physician professionals more accountable to society? Do you want Kate to answer that or me? Both of you. Kate's going to Kate's gonna take it over in about 30 seconds so that we can hear her poetry, but do you have a thought on it? <sighs> well, don't tell me what the poets are doing. No, um, sorry, as a prince talk, not a tragically hip talk. Um, I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, the very, the very quick answer in that is I think poetic applications of knowledge speak quite well to the aesthetic. Um, and, you know, I think that that, you know, I'm, I'm not a phenomenologist by orientation. I think a lot about Merleau-Ponty's work in terms of how objectivity may emerge from several lenses of subjectivity, for example. Um, I'm not well grounded in it, so I'm speaking like totally out of left field, but I would say that poetic learning, poetic education, poetic practice adds an extra layer of understanding from an aesthetic perspective, aesthetic, aesthetic not aesthetic, um, that I think can only be helpful. Um, because in a lot of ways, biomedical knowledge in and of itself is highly neutralizing in the way it sort of constructs its subjects, right? So, you know, we're constructed to be sort of, quote, neutral when in fact we occupy the intersection of myriad identities. There's nothing, like medicine is a fundamentally political act. It's nothing neutral about it. So um, I think a poetic sensibility can probably, and, and very, perhaps more so than almost anything, can probably inculcate a sensibility that this is anything but a value neutral practice. Yay, Katie, now you're going to offer us exactly that. Thanks, Brett. Um, yeah, Katie, I think if you're ready to take it, we're, you know, time marches on. So if you're ready to take anything on um, and, and you're ready to do your spontaneous poetry, I think maybe um, if you're ready, let's get started. But I'll say if there's any follow-up questions for Brett, I'll, I'll be sending an email to everybody here after with the recording. Um, so you can get back to me. I'll pass them on and I'll pass on anything that you need to get back and forth. Um, if that's okay with Brett and Katie. <laughs> okay. Um, I brought some poems of my own to write that, uh, uh, to read that respond to this. Um, uh, and I want to turn my little notes into a spontaneous poem that I type in my typewriter. But you're here, Brett. So um, uh, my way of understanding spontaneous poetry is to just take the words that I hear and mirror them back. These are unedited and they haven't been shaped and formed. Um, but I also think that a poet's uh, role is to be a mirror, you know, to, to, be, um, to be a mirror, to be a challenger, to be a prophet, to be a, a, a provoker, a pro what's that word? <laughs> Provocator, et cetera. Um, so I'm just going to read what I've written here as a spontaneous poem, and then I'm going to read some of my own poems. That's all right with people? Um, all right. So these are just uh, things that I heard because I'm not scientific at all, but just uh, I trickled it down. We all live in houses, house management, households, keeping our houses in order, from royal college and a convent to these tiny Hollywood squares. Zoom, we are here in the third wave of, wave of COVID. Citizens of this world, pandemic. It's world, it's people in epidemic. And we listen on mute to an animated medical citizen searching for synergy, looking through windows of societal needs and the four commitments to self, to patients, profession and society. Towards individuals, a list of evidence words, but professional lyrics less clear 
as if a smear of purple rain, vague and unclear. Here, one lovely asterisk, a star that describes what? Medicine's contract with society, implicitly muddy as well. Medicine abused its monopoly, much of it unwritten. Monopoly, do not pass go, do not collect $2,000. Seven signs from society of good medicine, service, healer, altruism, more morality, integrity, transparency, and accountability. Whose societal expectations? Doctors, a part of the whole, apart from the whole. One less than 1% for the 99%. Made by physicians for physicians, implicit to complicit, it matters, we matters, 37 million matters, lives, equity, five pillars, different structures, different home care. Perhaps we need more voices of society, new possible parts and posts and beams to crisscross pillars of privilege. We need greatest and most diverse hair care needs from needs re freedom from dis-ease. We need new buildings, new bridges. There we go. I'll have to edit that. <laughs> uh, Katie, okay, I just wanna say I was watching everyone's face while you performed that and like shocking and amazing. Um, and I just, for everyone else, uh, I have watched Katie write spontaneous poems like over a hundred times and I never get over how impressive and amazing it is that she can do this. Um, so Brett, what do you think? Was it good? <laughs> I have no words. I mean, other than say it was, it was phenomenal. It was phenomenal. I, <laughs> wow. Well, thank you. What I love about spontaneous poetry is literally just here and mirror back. So I've put in a little bit of purple rain and even stuff beforehand, but, and, and here we are, but you know, I feel like often people receive a spontaneous poem well because it's so much of their own words or, you know, in your case, I know they were also rift and pilfered words, which is what poets do all the time. So even that is just like, we're on the same page. So thank you, thank you. I was going to read a few of my non-spontaneous poems from books. May I do that as well? I think we would all love to hear that, Katie. And and uh, just for everyone, so you know, like Katie has a lot of uh, poems on healing and, and, and wellness and her own, you know, healing journey. So that's what we're going to hear from right now. And, and she didn't write them off the top of her head, though they're just as impressive as what she just performed for you all. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I can only do one spontaneous poem. I was scribbling as fast as I could. Um, so I, I have about four or so poems. I was told I have 10 minutes. I hope that's all right. Um, the first one I just uh, wrote, <clears throat> I shouldn't say just, I wrote it um, at the beginning of this pandemic um, when you couldn't find toilet paper. And that's even an interesting, um, you know, uh, issue of privilege and hoarding. And what a, it was funny, but it wasn't funny um, that there was all kinds of hoarding. And one of the things I noticed um, was that I couldn't find yeast. Everybody must have decided that we're going to be in lockdown, so we're going to bake bread, which is kind of lovely and simple and going back to simple practices, which I love. Um, but I couldn't find yeast, no matter what. Um, so I, I found a recipe in my father's cookbook for bread out of beer and baking soda, so it didn't need yeast. And I think this poem, I hope, talks about um, emerging new and not the same. We keep saying returning to normal. And what I hope is, of course, we evolve and we don't at all come back to where we started. Um, so here we go, pantry. I find old flour and flax and honey so petrified it's grains of amber, like a pendant in a bubble. I can't find yeast for love or money. So I look through my dad's mother's recipe in a folder blotted with oil and lo, there is soda bread and beer batter, both in no need of leaven. My spirits brighten. I can make bread with baking soda. And the stash I've rescued from behind the jars, this loaf needs no kneading. And so I leave a warm tea towel on the stove, one left from the pile of scarves and silks I'm sewing into masks. 
I feel ancient with white flecks of flour on my apron. I will drink the beer with tonight's bread by the fire and melt the honey back into what it was, but in a new way, as really nothing is ever lost. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, so I have another poem that I wrote um, back when Alan Curdy was uh, washed up on the shore um, in Vancouver. Um, and I feel like it was a tragic death, um, but his death really opened up the eyes of Canadians to refugees. And um, so uh, I won't say more. It begins with an epigram by Naomi Shihad Nye. Sell. I would never scold an onion for causing tears, Naomi Shihab Nye. I learned the salt content of tears is the same as blood and the sea, that lysosomes are healing enzymes and sea salt has nourishing minerals. We are the same three-fourths water as the earth. Gray dead sea salt is the same as pinkish Himalayan, both so far from home. Tears are the same saline, whether they fall to the ground unnoticed or streak cheeks pressed close in a refugee boat. They dissolve the borders or should. Let us not wait for another boy washed up on shore. Salt, enzyme, saline, suffering. Let fear dissolve into the 73% that is us all. Um, so I have a couple more. Are we doing all right? I think we want to wrap up at, at, at seven, whatever time it is, you guys. <laughs> um, do a couple more. In chat, people are loving this and sending me messages about how much they love your poetry. So please do a couple more for us. Thank you. All right. So, um, this one's called A Mouse's Prayer. Um, and I just, you can probably already notice a lot of the themes of my poems are commonality and finding common ground. Um, and so this, uh, not everyone loves little mice. I actually happen to love little deer mice, but not everyone does. But when I think about, um, you know, the human rights and, and uh, human needs, and we all need the same thing, and we all should have rights, to the same things, I, I whittled it right down even to a mouse because all creatures need you know, food and shelter and love and these simple things. So without further ado, this is called A Mouse's Prayer. Oh, constant moon, you illuminate my tracks, almost imperceptible atop this thin blanket of ice-crusted snow. May you hide my scribblings and nibbles in shadowy corners and reveal for my shiny eyes pearls of hard corn, crumbs, and paper boxes of flakes I can gnaw holiness into. Send a beam slantwise into the farm window, dresser drawer's raggy nest of tattered flannel, where my babes lie opaque in woolen scraps, where my warm lima beans nestle together dreaming six small parts into one big mouse dream of nut butters and flecks of sharp cheddar. I will scurry my prayer across the stone mantle beneath the clock, my blessing on all cracks and cubby holes, my thanks for all things small and with seeds. My wish for protection from owl eyes and traps and things with lids. Oh moon, you see me when others do not. You know my brown fur's sheen and you reflect for me my own great smallness in your immensely dark and speckled sky. So I've been through a breast cancer journey. Um, thank you very much. Um, many, many surgeries and many, many um, chemo and, and radiation and things. Oh, Brent, you've got to go. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to send you that poem once I've edited it and typed it out. <laughs> All the best to you. Thank you. Um, what was I saying? Oh, so um, going through my um, cancer journey, um, uh, the Dr. Suarez, my doctor, when he found this, you know, 
two and a half centimeter tumor in my um, breast, he took my hand and he looked me into the eyes and he called me Katie, not Catherine, because it's Catherine on my file. But he had made the, the effort to know me by name. He took my hand, he looked into my eyes and he said, nothing you've done or didn't do brought about this cancer. It's just part of your journey. And I was so moved that, you know, with all the guilt and all the questions I could have had, that he would call me by name and look me in the eyes and say that. Um, so I could go on and on and on. And I just think that um, those seven beautiful, um, uh, what's the word, affirmations of medicine from society. You know, one of them was, um, where did I write those down? Well, anyway, they were so great. And one of them, I think, was that whole um, human, personal, um, interpersonal connection, you know. Um, so anyway, I'm going to, I wish I, I had my poem for Dr. Swears, but I don't have it with me. But I thought to end, I would read Sprout. So that after chemo, I got hair back. And it was sort of a new victory. And it makes me think post-COVID of new things that will happen. And hopefully some of the things that do not need to be resurrected can be left behind and we can make space for new things everywhere in our relationships, in our governmental policies, in our diversity and equality, um, in diverse voices, in, in policy, in, in, in our households and in our hearts. I really hope we make space um, for new shoots, and here it is spring. So this is called Sprout Post Chemo. Like that grade one bean project in a decorated Dixie cup, those little unfurlings of green poking up in the window, something is growing on the smooth garden of my scalp. Exotic as first fiddleheads, little lines of white tip dark spike up. Not pirate stubble or coarse hair shaved mean, these are baby fine, kitten fur. I cannot stop stroking these soft tassels as I smooth my palm over my crown. It's soothing to feel something grow. I do not speak the language of warrior, had not helmet or sword. I was shorn more as monk, stripped naked. I have no head for battle, but carry a banner for all people. I want to stand on this mountain's bald top in the fierce, refreshing wind, waving my flag in the light. So thank you all so, so much. I feel like, you know, as we're really striving for um, even vaccine uh, equity and all kinds of things right now, I just, um, I was very honored to be um, invited to be a part of this and it's lovely to see all your smiling faces and Brett was amazing and um, thank you Leslie, lovely Leslie. I love that she'll just call and say you can do this. I'm like okay, <laughs> you say I can do it, I can do it. Anyway, thank you, thank you. Good to see you Sarah too, lovely and thank you one and all and I guess Leslie you'll, you'll conclude the evening will you? Yes, I just, I sort of wanted to say, I see your message, Hazel and Neil. We do want more time for Q&A. Um, I think, oh. you know, we'll probably just extend the length of the event next time because there's so much good stuff to say and we're always so touched. Um, I want to say, uh, Brett is gone, but he did a wonderful job and we can't thank him enough. And Katie, uh, as you know, we cry at poetry together all the time. Um, thank you for making me teary. Uh, usually we're crying beside one another. I'm crying at you this time. Um, I think your ability to write spontaneous poetry is really special and it is a really amazing talent that can make things like Brett's presentation sort of understandable and personal and um, not to hawk our poets but also it's a little bit my job but Katie writes spontaneous poetry all the time so when I send out our follow-up email once our video is done rendering I'll give you a link to our website um, and I just, on a personal note, want to say Katie has written me poems that have, you know, gotten me through dark nights and dark days and have inspired me and are hanging on my walls. So it is something to keep in mind. Um, I just, I also want to say thank you to Canadian Association for Health Humanities. We've got the president and the pre past president here and many members. Um, thank you for everybody for coming. Uh, I know it's a very busy month, uh, but we have lots of people who want to see the recording and are thrilled. And I think this was, um, a very special event. So thank you to Katie and everyone for being here. <laughs> thank you, Leslie. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Brett, with his little toddlers. <laughs>
Um, does anyone, Sarah, president of Canadian Association, you're good. I can see your nose getting a little red, so I feel like you might have been likewise affected as I me. Was. I was totally tearing up, and I saw totally Lisa up. I saw Nicole tearing up. I think Tom was tearing up as well. The red nose is always a little giveaway. It's my number one, and so uh, you know, usually it's Katie and I crying. Katie, nice to see you ending a poetry event, not the one in tears for once. It's lovely. Like. <laughs> Good energy. Anyway, thank you so much. Um, thank you all for coming. Next month, we're going to have a presentation on UBC on healthcare access. The month after, we're going to be focusing on mental health. Lots of cool poets. It won't be Katie next month, but another lovely poet who will be here. And I hope that we'll see you all next time. And thank you for coming. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks, everybody.